welcome. Um, welcome to Happy Hour. Um, and I'm Elizabeth Bars. And today we're going to talk about um, a bit about the veterans experience. So I am my my plan is just to bring up uh, some slides, some PowerPoint slides. You know, we're talking a bit about um, the veterans experience and also about military culture. And of course, you can't have anything in the military without PowerPoint. Um, so I thought I'd bring up a little bit um, some ideas and some thoughts. Uh, these are some things that I talk about in my Humanities Montana talks around the state. Um, things I also talk about in um, our Veterans Experience History class at Missoula College. Um, so we'll do that for a few minutes, um, but then we can um, just sit and chat about any other issues about what Veterans Experience, um, anything that anyone wants to talk about. Every Again, everybody welcome. I have my, my Zinfandel here. <laughs> we'll make this nice happy hour um, uh, TGIF even nicer, although I was joking earlier that I have no idea if it's Friday or Monday anymore because I work at home. But let's let's all say that it's Friday today. Um, so just a few things uh, I'll go through um, with this, uh, things that I, we can talk about. Um, so these are some, some foods for thought, really, um, especially when it comes to Montana veterans. Um, about 7% of Americans today are either veterans or are currently serving. So about 93% of people in the United States today um, don't have any military service, uh, which plays into ideas today that there is a, you know, certain, a bit of um, cultural disconnect between those who've experienced life in the military and those who haven't. In Montana, though, about 10% of our population uh, is our veterans. We have a very high per capita. The second uh, most veterans in the country are in our state. And if you count military families, somewhere close to a third of Montanans is either a veteran or related in an immediate family relationship with the veteran. So we do have a lot more understanding, I think, of the veterans experience here in our state. Um, but even then, uh, you're looking at another two thirds uh, of, of Montanans that may not know a lot about the military experience or what veterans experience when they reintegrate after service. Uh, two other points to think about, I think, um, when we go through this, um, when, we, when we talk about veterans, is of course we've been at war in one way or another for the, almost the last 19 years since 2001 when the United States went uh, into Afghanistan. So we've, we've had really a multi-generational uh, war at this point. Um, I was in Afghanistan and my son now who's an active duty soldier uh, will likely go to Afghanistan unless something changes. So we're looking at actually a multi-generational a conflict in which many service members have deployed and served multiple tours of duty, um, been away from their families multiple times, um, which really plays into the experiences of today's veterans. Um, one final thing that I, I like to bring up a lot is this is also this um, really historical uh, tidbit, which, you know, you, we think about uh, when we deploy a veteran to war or a veteran even in, you know, in the military, they're often very young, of course, they're usually in their 20s, maybe their 30s. Well, disability claims after a war um, in American history do not normally peak until about 30 or 40 years after a conflict. So uh, when the United States committed uh, its military to World War II, Disability claims from World War II didn't peak until um, the 1980s. Uh, they're old, they've only recently peaked for Vietnam vets. So uh, when we're talking about the nation's commitment to veterans after, especially after wartime service, but also even after peacetime service, um, the nation commits to that veteran and their family, um, sometimes for many, many decades after that veteran's service. So these are just some, some things to think about uh, in terms of uh, particularly today's modern veteran and veterans here in Montana. Uh, a couple of things that I, I just wanted to bring up um, today that might spark some conversation. Uh, one is this idea of military identity and culture. Uh, one thing that I argue uh, a lot in my, in my class and, and in the talks that I give 
is that to greater or lesser extent, uh, the military really is, I believe, a, a, a particular subculture within American society. Um, and I think it's been timelessly that way. Veterans and the military have been uh, an aspect of every culture. And um, in some many cases, I think that those experiences are sort of timeless. But you're taking, the reason I, I argue this is you're taking, again, often very young people, you're putting them into an entirely different world than especially than civilian uh, civilian life, especially in America today. Um, so the, you take these young people and you put them into through an intense indoctrination and a training process. Uh, they develop their, they learn a new language. They are subject to a new legal system. They're subject to new standards of how they behave and dress and act. Uh, every aspect of their personal life is really under the microscope. Um, so you're really putting young people through in, in culture and they, they will absorb that new identity and that new culture to different, different um, you know, to different uh, levels. Obviously, those who are in a couple of years may absorb it less. Those of us uh, like me who was in the military for 21 years, um, we will absorb it maybe more. But I would argue that um, to greater or lesser extent, every veteran, when they leave that service, has been affected in some way through, by this identity. Uh, and I, I didn't um, start with this, but you know, I spent 21 years, I, I'm a retired army officer, I spent 21 years on active service. I, I deployed to three combat tours, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and before that to desert. I've been to other various deployments, humanitarian and otherwise. And even though I've been retired now um, a little over 10 years, that I still consider myself, my identity is still very, very much caught up in being a soldier. Um, I don't think that will ever leave me. Um, my kids know the language of the military because they've been raised with it because I still speak that way. So um, from my experience and, and from others, um, I think, you know, I, I really do think that this is a, a very important aspect of the veterans' identity that they take with them when they go into reintegrate back into civilian life. So on that note, um, what does that mean? You know, when we talk about the veterans experience, uh, there are uh, both very positive things that can come out of that service, but as well, there can be, you know, very negative things. And I think the negative, uh, the negative aspects of what happens to veterans gets the most publicity, uh, especially today, um, but also all the way through history. You know, things like um, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, obviously, the, the amputations, um, the burns, the suicide rates, substance abuse rates. Um, obviously, today's generation of veterans, with our medical care that we have in the military, survive some pretty horrific, um, horrific wounds. And so we have um, a lot of wounded veterans, both physically and psychologically, mentally, emotionally, that um, that now have to learn to live, you know, with these injuries. Now, uh, these I think these issues that I just mentioned I think get a lot of publicity. A, a couple of other things I'd like to just bring up today, though, that I think maybe get a little bit less publicity that I think are also very important. Um, and these are some things that we talk about in our Missoula College class. We have a History uh, 150 class at Missoula College, which um, was um, supported by Humanities Montana, and was, we were given a grant at Missoula College by the National Endowment for the Humanities to offer this class. It is now actually a regular class in the University of Montana system. But these are things that we talk with undergraduates about, about what are these experiences that veterans go through. So a few of these that we talk about in our, in our course First um, is really the historic, historical issues of veterans. Um, and, you know, even going all the way back um, to, you know, Greek antiquity, if you, if you read the tragedies, you know, of Sophocles, obviously you read about the veterans' experiences. But specifically in our class, which is an American history class, I think it's under underappreciated sometimes how vital and important that the veterans in American history have been to American political, economic, social, cultural development. So things like, for example, uh, you know, the the idea that that every 
at the time, um, you know, unfortunately, white men only, but white men could vote, that the common average man who didn't own property could vote was very much came out of the agitation of veterans after the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Um, the idea that the government could, uh, could or should provide disability benefits to its citizens, uh, the idea that it should pr protect people in old age very much came out of veterans benefits after every war in American history going back to the revolution. Uh, and so um, there's arguments by historians that you know, the welfare state, if you want to call it that, really has come out of the experience um, of veterans benefits. Um, including, of course, the, the GI Bill, the post the post uh, World War II GI Bill of benefits that um, that really built the American middle class with the education benefits and the and the housing loans and everything that built suburban America and built the wealth of of the middle class in the 1950s and 60s. Um, that is is really a, an important part of the veterans um, the veterans experience and a part of American history, and I would add really significantly today, which is Juneteenth, um, and I hope Americans are pausing to think about Juneteenth and and the the legacy um, of African Americans contributions to uh, to the United States for four hundred years. If you look at um, Really, the, the 200,000 African Americans who served during the Civil War, um, the, you know, including 16 Medal of Honor winners, it was largely through their own service where they convinced Northerners, right, you know, as racist as the North could still be, that they deserve citizenship, not only emancipation, but to be treated as equal citizens. And it was African American veterans, largely, that convinced a lot of Northerners of their value as American citizens. Um, and then, you know, with the, you know, mentioning the, the, the post-World War II GI Bill, as uh, you know, a thing to think about on Juneteenth is the legacy of the, the, the GI Bill for, um, for World War II veterans was to build the American middle class, but sadly, tragically, um, African-American uh, GIs after World War II were systemically excluded from most GI Bill benefits through housing redlining, uh, through the uh, inability to go to college and use their GI Bill benefits. And so obviously, um, as historians have well documented by the 1960s, the household wealth of African-American families and white families you know, were, were hugely different because um, of the ability or lack of ability to use veterans benefits. So th these are, you know, very, very briefly important things that I think are, they're not talked about as much with the veterans experience. Um, a few other things quickly are also, you know, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress um, in, with our veterans today and through history, shell shock, and, and it's really, um, now just a new name for things that have really been around for, for millennia. Um, but this, in addition to PTS, which is a fear-based trauma, um, there's a lot more work being done now studying veterans in terms of uh, the issue of moral injury. Uh, there are great um, psychologists and philosophers, uh, you know, Do jo Jonathan Shea, who's a VA psychologist, um, Nancy Sherman at Georgetown, who is... Um, uh, a philosophy professor who talk about this issue of moral injury, where a veteran may not have a, 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 a fear-based trauma like post-traumatic stress, but they may have a shame or a guilt-based trauma, survivor's guilt, the guilt of being involved with something that they don't feel was morally correct, that their moral compass is injured. And I think this is another issue that um, needs much more research and, and, and um, you know, thought by American citizens looking at what war um, or military service can do to a veteran. Um, a couple of other issues, again, that, that don't get as much, um, are not as much talked about as things like as PTS or TBI, just the simple idea of alienation. When veterans, we talk about veterans going through this crucible of military training and a very intense formative experience when they're young, a camaraderie with a cohort of 
of young people that are probably very much, that maybe they didn't start out alike, but they become very much alike through military training and living together, working together, deploying together. And then you take them out of that world and you reintegrate them into uh, a civilian world. And many of them feel profound alienation. They feel an alienation in terms of habits and self, you know, in the discipline of day-to-day -day life. The, the civilian world, many veterans will say, is, is very noisy, um, is very chaotic, as opposed to a military lifestyle. Well, you, it could be very chaotic as well and very noisy, but in a very different way. Um, in some ways, war and, and military service can be very simple. Um, and then that leads to things about with communication. Uh, I, I think it's important um, when you talk about the veteran's experience to talk about not just the veteran, but their military family. Um, we are, none of us, few of us are islands unto ourselves. We have uh, parents and spouses and children and siblings um, that are part of our lives. And so in, in this reintegration process, what challenges do veterans experience with communication, with reintegrating not only into society, but with their families, as particularly, as I said, with these multiple deployments, how do veterans uh, relate to their families? How do they relate to civilians who may not speak their military language or understand uh, what they've been through? A lot of veterans, both wartime uh, and peacetime veterans will often say, you know, I can't really talk about my military service, you won't understand. Uh, and so then they don't talk about it, maybe except with other veterans. And that's, a, I think, another common theme. And then finally, one other thing I think is really great to talk about with the veterans experience are not only these challenges that veterans experience, but also the incredible resilience and post-traumatic growth uh, that uh, veterans can experience. Um, we talk a lot about Rhonda Cornum, who was um, a flight surgeon who was shot down during Desert Storm and taken prisoner during Desert Storm, and, and she was assaulted and had both her arms broken, and, and she, she's really, you know, got very involved in, in the Army and the greater military's um, uh, talk about how do you build resilience, how do you build post-traumatic growth in people, and I think the military really leads in that. The number of veterans uh, who uh, run nonprofits, who volunteer, who start small businesses, who do all of these things that we tend to accredit to the greatest generation after World War II, uh, you know, Vietnam veterans and today's veterans also have been doing all those things. Um, this idea that they take that need to serve and to be part of something greater than themselves and they take that out to their communities, um, and really um, become really valuable members of the community. So I think, uh, I think resilience and post-traumatic growth is another really important part of the veterans' experience. Um, and then briefly, I think one way um, if for people to understand these issues, to understand how do you understand an experience of someone in a culture, that, let's say the military culture, if you've never uh, if you've never been part of that culture, how, you know, how do you understand someone in a different ethnic culture or religious culture if you've never been part of that? Well, I think the humanities is one way to figure that out, one, is one way to understand the visceral experiences. So history, literature, philosophy, um, we use um, this book, Standing Down, uh, which is also here. It's a wonderful collection of excerpts, fiction um, and nonfiction experts, excerpts, a lot of them written by veterans, but also classics like excerpts from the Iliad um, that really talk to these veterans' experiences. Uh, I mentioned um, Sophocles' plays. There's a wonderful project call, uh, called Theater of War where reading the plays of Sophocles, you can see that veterans like Ajax we're going through a lot of the same anger issues that some veterans experience today, feelings of guilt, feelings of survivor's guilt, all of these different things. Um, the works of Hemingway, which is in this Standing Down book, Carl, Mar Carl Marlantes, who wrote about his experiences in Vietnam. Um, but so many of these humanities sources, I think really get to some of really trying to get into the, the mind and the heart of a veteran to try to see uh, where they've been and how they are reintegrating, how they're dealing with their, uh, their experiences. Um, and so I, I really do uh, encourage um, reading of the humanities to understand more about veterans. So 
um, finally, it's just a quote from a VA website that really talks about, you know, veterans will differ probably in the extent to which um, they continue to, to identify with the military uh, after they get out of the military. But um, I think every veteran probably um, has some um, effect of their military service, of this culture that they've been steeped in, of this new identity that they took on at a young age. Uh, and so I think it's valuable and important um, as engaged citizens, uh, as voters who we are the ones who choose to what we do with the United States military. We're the ones who send our young men and women to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. We're the ones who decide what their military experience is going to be like in many cases, what their housing is going to be like and their chow is going to be like and the wars that they're going to go have to fight in, that we understand a little bit about um, what their lives are like in the military and then what are the, the challenges and triumphs of their reintegration. So that's, um, I, that is sort of the formal portion. Um, I'd love to just chat about any of this or we can chat about other things that are not um, one of the things I mentioned. And I will stop and have some wine. Jeanette, you're, there you go. Thank you, Samantha. Hi, I'm so sorry I'm late. I try not to be rude and be late, but I, I booked myself a few things today. <laughs> I'm usually compulsively organized. Um, so I teach at Carroll College. I teach history. Oh, and wonderful. I'm extensively in the Middle East and Pakistan. Oh, so wonderful. Student, a lot of veterans that have served in Iraq and Afghanistan come and, and they spend a lot of time talking to me. And it's pretty, it can be pretty traumatic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, and I know that this research has been going on since World War II, and I'm, I'm, I'm relatively familiar with it, but something I, and I would just like to hear your thoughts, right? One of the things that does not get talked about is they didn't have a mil just they they had but they didn't just have a military experience they had a cultural experience as well where they met people from different cultures who they it turns out are not the enemy I had one student who Helena Montana was not nearly as exciting as Fallujah and he was just having a really hard time but also he said I knew people I got to know them I knew their families. Etc. And so in many ways, it was not just helping him navigate the military part of coming home, but it was helping him navigate what I see, what I went through and what my students go through, which is re reverse culture shock. They were immersed in another culture. And I think we forget that. Um, and so I just was wondering if you could say a few words about that. Yeah, you know, that's a fantastic point. Um, and I, I didn't mention I'm, I'm an actual doctoral candidate now. I'm doing my doctorate in history, but it's American history. But I love Middle Eastern. I'm fascinated by Middle Eastern history. <laughs> um, I just don't have the language, so I'm sticking with American history right now. Um, no, that's a fantastic point. And, you know, that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of formative experiences. You're yeah. taking young people. Um, again, you know, the average age of, you know, the, someone who joins the military is 18, 19, or 20, um, and you're putting them through this crucible of training and indoctrination and standards, but then you're also sending them somewhere. You're sending them on a ship around the world for six months, or, um, you know, those of us, uh, you know, who were sent, you know, after, one after another, Iraq, Afghanistan, maybe North Africa, maybe, you know, Syria, and, what does that do to that young person, I think, is, is absolutely, uh, you know, imperative. They, they're not only dealing with, you know, having to learn the technical and tactical competencies that they have to do to do the mission right and to survive and to support, you know, the people to the left and the right of them, but then they're absorbing all of this. Um, you know, I think there's two things there. I think it's that culture thing. So then they come back to the United States and they could come back a completely, really different person um, than what they, when they left Haver, Montana. Um, and maybe they have different views than their family members have now, or they have different views um, for, you know, about the world. And so now there are a couple of things I think. One is, you know, going back to the idea of alienation and communication. Now they're trying to fit back into maybe a, a small town or, you know, big town, whatever, and trying to navigate the differences of their ideas with former friends and, you know, with friends and family who no longer understand them. And they no, no longer understand their family and friends. It could, can be some deep, deep alienation. Um, 
I think also um, that then, um, so that, that I think that very much plays into the alienation part, but it also I think goes to that idea of resilience and post-traumatic growth for some of them. I think for a lot of us, that lived and worked um, in, you know, you know, I've spent multiple tours in the Middle East and, and you just, you, you cannot absorb how the different the rest of the world is from the United States without it definitely affecting you. Um, and so you bring that home and, and for many, it really turns into a sense of purpose to really become a more, you know, engaged global citizen that that you know these Iraqis are you know are, or these Afghanis are no different than us they love their kids and they want the best for their kids I mean and for some it, it evokes a very deep personal connection and empathy with people um, even who are former combatants I mean I, we see from Vietnam those who went to Vietnam I have several friends uh, my both my dad and my stepdad served in Vietnam so both my, my dad my dads were were uh, Vietnam vets, but the desire of some of their buddies to go back and reconnect with with people who were actually at the time combatants or villages that they, you know, think bad things happened, that need for closure because they saw the humanity in people who were enemies. So all of these issues. Um, anyway, I could go on and on, but I, I think that it's such a huge change for. Um, for young people especially to go through these experiences and what does that do for the rest of their lives it's it's profound it's profound they do come to my i, I will a very quick story i do speak arabic which is very oh, helpful. Or, yeah it's very helpful um but i had a student a veteran who came back from iraq and um i, I teach my students certain words and one of them of course is habibi and you know shukran habibi thank you friend mm -hmm. nobody bothered to tell him that that wasn't an epithet and he didn't realize that what they were doing was thanking him and his colleagues for crayons and coloring books and pencils. And he's like, all they were doing was thanking me. And I said, pretty much. They just wanted to say thank you for these things, right? And that was a form of deep kind of personal trauma for them. But I always try to get my vets to share their experiences in my Middle East and Islam classes. And yeah. they're terrific. And they share their pictures, which is even better. Yeah. Well, and just, I mean, another thought on that though, Jeanette, I think is, is you would think about though, you, you, they've been through this experience when they're, let's say they're 25 years old. And then they come back to the United States and they go into a life that they go back, maybe they go, they use their GI Bill, they go to college. For a lot of veterans though, that can be, that can spur them to do some pretty cool things with the rest of their life. But for others, they never feel that, they, they really have a hard time re-finding that sense of purpose. Um, you know, of that, that sense that they were really for, you know, sometimes trying to help another people. I think, I think, I don't, you know, you know, for whatever you think about the Iraq war, I don't think any service member deployed to Iraq thinking that they were going to screw up the country more. They wanted to help, you know, they, and that's the nature, I think, of, 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 thank goodness, of our service members. They want to help. And so, but refinding that sense of purpose when they come home, or that side of sense of excitement, that adrenaline rush. How you know? Why do so many veterans take up extreme sports after they leave the service? Because they're looking for that, you know, that adrenaline rush for the rest of their lives. Anyway, yeah, those um, great, great points. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you, Liz. I wanted to say, you know, not as a veteran, but as someone who's been overseas, I I feel very similar talking to people about my experience overseas and um i'm not trying to conflate my experience with with veterans experiences but um i want to go back to that quote that you put up from the va because i think the thing that struck me most about that quote is how critical it is for non-veteran americans to um be able to contextualize veterans ex experiences and be able to understand what they've gone through and, and sort of uh, get to a better place of empathy where they can actually engage with them. I think that's really, really important um, yeah. so that they can release some of their, you know, all of this stuff that's inside that they, that they want to want to share and they want to say uh, to the world. But, you know, my experience talking with people often is just very, very surface and really, really shallow about my experiences overseas. Um, so I imagine it must be a lot worse 
and a lot more uh, kind of more intense maybe uh, for, for veterans trying to do the same thing. You know, I, Dylan, I know, you know, we've, you and I, we've talked about this. I know you, I, I think it's very similar though. I think, you know, anybody who's been experienced, you know, had, you know, experiences, for example, just, you know, living overseas and vet, a lot, you know, a lot of veterans, you know, are overseas, not in combat. They're stationed in Germany or Italy or Korea or Japan. And they're going through these, these experiences, you know, um, like you have living overseas, experiencing other cultures and, and then, coming back and not knowing how to talk to people about, you know, not even just combat experiences, but like you said, that they, they want to, you know, talk about the world differently and their own themselves differently vis-a-vis -vis those experiences. And it probably is, I think, very similar. I've heard this from friends who've been in the state department for 30 years and come back and they, you know, they're, they don't, they don't feel, they feel out of a fish out of water, but who, but they said, well, nobody will really understand. And like you said, people, don't want to get into the depths of the conversation. They just want to say, well, you know, what was the shopping like, you know? <laughs> yeah, it feels like they don't really want to talk about it, you know? Yeah. It, it kind of just feels like that sometimes. But, but you know what? I think it's fascinating with this, you know, with culture, and, I, and I'm arguing obviously that the military is a culture. You know, for me to try to understand, I know that I'm probably reticent when I try to talk to somebody who's been in a totally different culture, you know, a kid who's grown up in the south side of Chicago, in an inner city urban uh, culture, he's African American kid, and I'm trying to say, well, I want to understand your culture, but I don't. I'm afraid to. What questions do I ask? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to insult mm. you somehow? And so, I think this is the same with vets. You stay on a very superficial level because you don't want to, you know, say, hey, did you kill somebody? You know, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you people. So you stay on a superficial level, but then the veteran or the world traveler or whomever doesn't feel like, or the kid from South South Chicago doesn't feel like they, no one ever really is interested in what they really have to say. Anyway, yeah, I, I think it's a great analogy. Liz, this is, this is a little off topic, but we've heard the term, uh, a term thrown around a lot in the last few weeks, especially the militarization of the police. And I'm, and, and no one ever kind of goes to the military to talk about how that term feels for them or what they think of that term. I'm curious how you respond to that. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's, you're definitely getting into uh, a very, a very, um, obviously it's a political question. Um, it's a cultural question for those of us, I think, who've been in the military. Um, I mean, I can give you my personal take on it. Um, I'm just speaking for myself. I, I think, um, uh, and I have a, my, my, my stepdaughter, actually, I have a stepdaughter who is a cop. I have a, she's a police officer, fine, incredible young woman who's a, a police officer in DC. So she's, I mean, she's, she's seen this stuff. I think, um, there, I, I think, and she and I have had some conversations about this. There's got to be a huge difference between what the military does and what um, law enforcement does. Um, and a lot of us um, feel very uncomfortable, as I think a lot of police officers do. I know police officers, that, and they're wonderful servants of their communities, um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, community policing and being part of, you know, supporting law, law laws and the peace and supporting, um, the running, the social fabric of a community even. I mean, that's what police do. So to militarize the police, I think, can be, can be a very difficult thing. Um, it, it's not, um, you know, to, not, to try to not be too overly dramatic about this, the, the purpose of the military is to kill. I mean, it just is. I mean, that's what the military's purpose is. Um, obviously, the, the United States military does amazing things with humanitarian work and nation building and all of these really important things. But tragically, humans go to war a lot and tragically, humans have militaries to fight their wars because um, we haven't figured out how to do anything else. So 
Um, the purpose of the military is to bring lethal force into a conflict. Um, and I think that should be, that's a very different idea than, than what the police do. So I think a lot of us in the military are very uncomfortable with this idea of militarizing police. Not that they shouldn't have whatever, you know, obviously equipment they need, but it's a, it should be a different idea. Um, there's a saying in the military that don't forget, you're, you're never the wolf, you're always the sheepdog. Um, you're never the wolf. Um, you're there to protect. But the military, I'd go one further, I'd say the police definitely are sheepdogs. The military does, is, is they're designed to bring lethal force. Um, one other thing I think it's important to remember uh, because of this, the recent political discussions, the National Guard is, is trained in riot control. The National Guard is trained to support civil disturbances and to try to back up the police. Um, I would agree with several of our general officers recently who have said bringing in active duty forces um, is, is very problematic. It can, be, it, it can be done in dire situations as it was in, 19, um, in, you know, in, in 1992 in, um, in LA. Um, but I think it's, it, it, the active duty force is not designed and not trained for law enforcement. They're trained to bring lethal force against an enemy combatant. And so, the, you know, all of these issues I think are really important um, to remember. Um, and then finally, I would add just one thing. Um, putting our military in those difficult situations where they're called upon to do things that they're not designed to do is only going to make it difficult. It's going to, it's going to increase that military civilian divide, I think. Um, uh, I think it, again, it, it goes to more, uh, if more Americans try to understand what the, the missions and the purpose of the United States military is, I think it's better to understand the difference between active duty forces and National Guard missions, I think is important. Things like that, I think, help with these, with these, um, with these conversations. And the, the critical idea that the military has got to remain apolitical. Um, in other words, um, don't put us to don't put the military in the middle of political arguments um, because um, if the you know it's just important that the the, the American people can trust um, and trust its military and not be put into those political arguments. But anyway, okay, all of that <laughs> does that kind of answer that? Do police have to um, deal with a lot more sort of? Um, violence in terms of militarization uh in terms of coming back at them <laughs> in in inner cities more than ever before you know with guns in america and i mean is that why they ramp up it does i mean that, yeah and, you know, that's a, it is i mean i think situations that, yeah i mean the fact that we've got the you know obviously with you know automatic weapons now you know in the hands of so many americans and um, whatever you feel you know whatever people feel about the gun debate yeah, the firepower on American streets is crazy. Um, but, you know, and again, I'm, I have no experience and no expertise in law enforcement, but there's still, you know, uh, there's still the, you know, I think um, a difference between, bare, you know, even with a number of, of you know, of weapons, um, that are military grade weapons that civilians now own, or even you know, some criminals have, um, it's still, I think, difficult um, in a in a situation to bring that kind of it's, it's it's the you know that idea of the militarization in terms of bringing lethal force into a community policing situation. I think has still got to be problematic. But yeah, it is. It's tough. I mean, these are tough issues that um, that we have in the country. Obviously, I think about my brother-in-law who's in Missoula, and he's a great police officer too. And you know he's, but he's also interested in and in, in training in SWAT and yeah. has police dogs and you know even some of the the things that um, I've seen in Missoula on Missoula, Missoula streets have been kind of shockingly. Yeah, you know it. It reminds me with the the disturbances recently. Um, it it some of it obviously, and I've and I've talked to my my stepdaughter who has been in D.C. with the horrible property damage and the cops getting stuff thrown at them, which was horrible. I mean, to think you know, just the people, the opportunists that are taking advantage of peaceful pro protests and the you know the, the ones that are out there um, doing things. It, it does to some extent remind me of the counterinsurgency. Not not I'm not equating them, but 
when you're working in a civilian population in Baghdad, for example, and you're trying to understand the difference between a bunch of kids throwing rocks at you because they're bored versus real insurgents. And, and you know, going back to, you know, what we've been talking about, the veteran, you know, a young 22 year old sergeant on the streets of Baghdad has to make some split second decisions, just like a cop does in DC or New York or Missoula, has to make some split second decisions about what level of force to use in that situation. Um, and I think, and again, I, I don't know anything about law enforcement. I, I think though, the same way that we've asked our young sergeants and lieutenants to gain the trust and confidence of villagers in villages in Afghanistan and people on the streets of Baghdad and Fallujah um, to try to navigate those really difficult situations and become in some ways police, but really to gain trust and confidence um, in, that, in that place. It's sort of the same things we're asking police to do in some pretty in rough, you know, in rough situations too. So yeah, there are parallels with counterinsurgencies, I think. Um, but again, going back to this idea that I think we still have to be careful um, about these are we're not talking about people in Iraq, we're talking about fellow American citizens. So it's these are these are tough, these are tough ideas. Liz, you kind of talked about um, politics and military and keeping them separate. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, um, you know, when I see movies or like the popular cultural representation of people in the military, it says like, um, like conservative, um, Republican kind of like very conservative white men who like have this strict rule in their family or whatever it is like that's what I think of first. But um, all of the veterans that I actually know personally are very progressive and liberal. Could you talk a little bit like I mean that's just from my perspective, but what do you see. Yeah, you know that's it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think if any political party say again what Dylan. No. I'm sorry. no, no, no. I think um, I think if any political party or politician thinks that the military is all on their side, then they probably are not paying much attention or don't know much about the military. I mean, I think there's two things. I think first of all, the military very much represents American society at large. You have extreme progressives and you have very conservative, you know, conservatives. And not that those labels, I don't even know what those labels mean half the time anymore with our politics today. But anyway. Um, uh, there's a couple things. So I think that I think that the the average um, person in the military very much reflects the full spectrum of American politics. Um, I mean, if you know, if if uh, that you know, back in the Reagan days, a lot of people would say, oh well, the military only votes you know Republican. Well, because you know they thought that the the you know the price the um, their, their salaries, the cost, you know, cost of living adjustments and salaries were only going up under Republicans. The military pay has gone up under both, you know, our military budgets have been great under both, you know, R's and D's and the VA has been supported by R's and D's. So all of that, I, I don't think plays any more than it, as it did in the 1980s. But I think a couple things, um, again, it, I think that people in the military represent every political persuasion. I think that um, a lot of military, like me, I didn't vote for 21 years when I was on active duty. It's just sort of a tradition, I think. I think especially for officers and, and non-commissioned officers, we don't, a lot of us don't tend to vote when we're on active duty. Um, but some do, and if they do, that's great. Um, but I think it's, uh, going back to this idea of indoctrination, I believe a lot of veterans are really, really, really trained um, and inculcated with this, these ideas of respect. Um, like Jeanette said, they are introduced to the world, most veterans, they see the world, they, they visit places, they see um, that people in these countries are very much like them and have the same hopes and dreams and fears that they have. Um, so I think a lot of veterans, um, whether they vote R or D or Green Party or whatever they vote, you know, they, I, I think a lot of veterans that I meet personally also are very concerned about character and thing, issues of character and respect for their fellow man. It, you, you, it is drummed into you, you know, in the army values as I had, I think in one of my slides, loyalty, duty, respect, selflessness. 
honor, integrity, personal courage. I mean, honor is something that you actually talk about all the time in the military. Um, being honorable, caring about your fellow man, being respectful. So whether um, you're on the far left or the far right or somewhere in between, um, I think it is, a, I, I see a lot of veterans that do care a lot about those issues, I think um, of, and, and the reason I'm saying that is like General Mattis has said, and, and my former boss, General Martin Dempsey, one of the biggest concerns I, I hear more about veterans right now is not as much about whether you know conservative policies or or progressive policies but about the fraying of american togetherness this idea you know we take kids from inner city south chicago and rural georgia and surfer kids from santa cruz california and we turn them all into soldiers in the army i don't care where you're from i don't care what color you are i don't care what religion you are you are we turn you green and we and we care that you all work together as a team and I think it's what's really disturbing for a lot of vets is to see the divisiveness in our politics. Um, this is personally, this is just me talking, but I, I think a lot of veterans on, on the left or right, that's what really bothers them, is that we have fought and supported the Constitution and, and love our fellow citizens, and to see people at each other's throats is really disturbing. Um, and that's the danger right now. Um, but anyway, I could go on. I'll stop. <laughs> In those humanities resources you shared, do you have like a top recommendation? Yeah, you know, I, I do. I, I really, like I said, the Standing Down book to me, um, Kim here is actually the one who turned me on to this a few years ago and I use it, I use it in my college class at Missoula College. I use it, I teach online at Eastern Kentucky University. I use it and I've used it in a lot of other forums. I think it has a, a fantastic cross-section of veterans from different eras. Again, it goes all the way back to Greek, you know, ancient Greece, all the way, you know, um, through all of our uh, wars, you know, American wars. Um, and yeah, it has excerpts, again, I, I, there's a great um, story, for example, from Ernest Hemingway called Soldier's Home, in which a young a uh, young boy, young man from, uh, from, comes home from World War I, and he has a profound difficulty communicating with his family. His parents now expect him to settle down, get married, get a job, do everything you're supposed to do as a 22-year-old man in, you know, 1919. Um, and he's having a really hard time. He can't talk about it. Um, he feels like he has to lie about his service or you know exaggerate or you know give war stories the only people he can talk to are fellow veterans um that's one example in this book i think um, um of, of really showing these visceral experiences and I, I recommend the book mostly because it has very short stories that you can absorb and get different flavors of different themes but yeah there's so many uh, so many great humanity sources the plays of sophocles um, I think are fantastic. Um, uh, anything by Tim O'Brien, of course, you know. Um, and anyway, there's, but um, I think uh, reading the humanities and, and reading philosophy, reading just war theory, uh, understanding, we didn't talk much about moral injury, but I think this is a really important thing to try to understand veterans if reading just war theory, reading, under trying to understand how, again, you know, as Dylan and I were talking about how young 22-year-old sergeants are put into some pretty fundamentally difficult ethical dilemmas, just like our police officers are. Um, and they have to make split sections of decisions and then live with those decisions the rest of their lives. Um, they see things in the Middle East and other places um, that affect them the rest of their lives. So reading philosophy and ethics um, and experiences of veterans in those veins, I think, is also helpful. I have a that book stand, so in a very very bizarre turn of events this little pacifist here is going to be teaching U.S. military history in the spring for our ROTC students oh fantastic oh yes well oh I know right <laughs> so I've been you know I know that um General Mattis thinks that every soldier should read Marcus Aurelius's meditation <laughs> so we'll be doing the meditations which I think that yeah I this is, this is going to be a thing right it's gonna be a whole thing yeah and um would standing down work for my ROTC students? Or is that really more for veterans? 
No, I think it would be fantastic for ROTC students. Now it's not, you know, it's not technically a historical source. I mean, some of them, I, I use it as I, cause I use it in my history 151 at Missoula College as primary sources. So yeah, I think it absolutely would not. There are some nonfiction in there. So obviously, you know, there, but they are, I think there's enough historical sources blended in with the, yeah, I think it would. And I, I can tell you, Jenna, I think every veteran that I, know personally that's that's you know uh, read the standing down excerpts um and there's dozens and dozens of of stories and excerpts in there everyone has said that they resonate with them so i think it would definitely give your rotc students um, a flavor of some of these issues Absolutely. and i do want them to i mean you know give me a break i'm a historian we want them to read primary sources it's, it's, and fiction i mean literature we want them to do all of this right yes. I mean, they, they handed me these two textbooks uh -huh. This is what they get. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have textbooks, but we're just, no. Well, I mean, and there's more to life than these two big yeah. textbooks that, you know, I don't even know how I'm going to get them to school. Um, so this, these, are, these are good things to know. Well, and one other, just one other thing I'd recommend to you, I think we have a few minutes left. Two others that I just, you know, as an American um, wannabe historian, um, uh, You're well on your way. I want to have more, yeah, dissertating. I'm dissertating like crazy. Uh -huh. um, Paul Paul Fussell and Jay Winter are both fantastic. I I think both um, in terms of studying how um, we remember. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about statues and naming of posts and things like that but how do we remember war how do we remember the veterans experience both paul fussell and jay winter um and the whole the whole literature of world war one and remembering that you know sort of a dystopian shattering event of world war one i've used that i think that really resonates with a lot of of students too from two really fantastic historians i i've used some of that too i think that's great that's great. And I'll just, here's a tip from somebody who is done dissertating. Yes. Last six weeks are the worst. <laughs> just saying, if you can survive the last six weeks, Red, and he's naughty, you're golden. Well, thank you. I'm I still, still think I'm about still, it and think there's something I can do. <laughs> I'm still pretty much working on my third chapter, so I have a ways to go, but I'm getting there. I, we have a great history department here at UM, so I am incredibly lucky. Good for thank you. you. That's, a, thank that's a great thing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, as in, I, I don't know if I didn't men mention this either, but you know, that's part of the veterans experience that at 40 something years old, I had to find a new life. You know, you get out of the military at 25 or 35 or 45. What do you do with the rest of your life? So I decided to go back to school, but every veteran goes through that. You know, do they go back to school? Do they get a job? Part of what you said, they've, you know, the places they've been and things they've seen, now they have to go actually find a new job and do something. Um, part of the veterans experience, but thank you. I appreciate it. I wanted to, t to talk more about the painting in the slides on their, on your presentation. You know, and I, um, so uh, Professor Matt Semenoff at UM actually helps with our, our course and he comes in and talks about Philoctetes and Ajax and the Greek tragedies where all I can tell you that I know about this. So again, um, I'm 20th century American history, but Ajax um, comes back, uh, you know, from war, and he ends up slaughtering his animals. He goes into a rage and slaughters his animals. Um, we actually had an incident at Fort Drum when I was there, Fort Drum, New York, um, where a soldier killed his dogs, you know, had coming back from, from uh, being deployed. And at it, it, the time, it was profoundly reminded me um, of, of Ajax's story. Uh, so I don't, I don't know much more about it, but I've met so many veterans when they when they read thing you know excerpts of Odysseus or you know the tragedies the Greek tragedy tragedies said oh my gosh veterans have been experiencing these same things for two thousand three thousand you know three thousand years um, so that's why I put that in there yeah Lisa the one other thing though would be I don't talk about art at all but so many of our veterans. Um, here in Missoula, especially get involved in so many projects of art is another way to mm -hmm. sort of express um, uh, their experiences and how they relate to their military experiences. My background is in literature, so I'm actually um, <laughs> closer to um, the understanding of it through literature. Um, I, I would agree that Standing Down is a fantastic book. I would 
taught it in a college class easily. Um, just like it is a solid, um, you know, primary source across um, lots of different viewpoints. Um, takes under takes um, a lot of perspectives under consideration and, and really gives great questions at the end that start discussions. I mean, we used it for a while in a humanities Montana group. Um, the, the using art as healing has been coming up a lot um, in the last couple of years. And I've been, I've been intrigued by it, but I haven't been involved in it. But um, I think that because art asks you to step outside yourself a bit, um, that the empathy aspect of it um, is really healing for a, for a lot. And, you know, when I was teaching literature, I taught Wilfred Owen quite a lot and, and the literature of World War I quite a lot. And I think that, that the literature of World War I is excellent. And it also um, is, I found it distant enough um, where World War II, like people's grandpas, are still part of it. So there's a, like they're thinking of their grandpas, but nobody has a direct connection to World War I anymore. So it's, there's a way that you can, that you can learn. It's, it's close enough, but you can still, um, I don't know, I just found it more powerful. Um, and it was in so many ways, the first time people were um, really not, had their um, values questioned in in such a major way so to to think about it um, using world war one literature to um, confront people questioning their own values is i think terrific um, so i thought that standing down book had um i i had taught literature of world war one for 10 years or so and i thought the standing down um selections were really good so Two thumbs up, recommending that book. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah, Wilfred Dulce de Cormest is in Standing Down. I mean, I, I had not been familiar with him until I actually started you know, doing this. And wow, incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. incredibly powerful literature. Thank you all for being here. Um, it was a nice small group. And thank you, Liz, for your presentation. I felt yeah. like a lot. It's really interesting. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. I appreciate all. I appreciate it. And this was great. I, I, it was lovely to see everybody um, and to re meet new people that I haven't met. So thank you all very much. Thank you.